السلام عليكم شو اخباركم شلونكم معاكم حلقه جديده برنامج ويانا معاكم يوسف الرومي علي اشكراني طبعا اليوم عندنا هم بعد <تصفيق> بدايه الموسم بدايه الموسم زين السيزون 2 زين ومع شخص صراحه مو طبيعي أي أي للامانه لسته هالطول لسته هالطول لا وهو كشخص قوي الصراحه أي يعني شو اسمه وطبعا مثل ما انت قلت عنده لسته هالطول و ومسوي ما شاء الله ماكو شيء مو مشتغل عليه ما شاء الله ما شاء من الله. افلام من انمي من العاب من أف... من مسلسلات فنحيي ضيفنا حق اول حلقه موسم سيزون 2 برنامج ويانا جي بي بلانك اي جي بي يور اون اير It's very early in the morning in Los Angeles hi everybody hello <laughs> so yeah um Good morning, JV. Good morning. <laughs> Cheers. Just checking whether my coffee is strong enough for this uh, whole exercise. <laughs> so yeah, um, thank you for you know uh, being on the show with us, uh, uh, getting to, to to interview you, and uh, we uh, you know got to chat with you just a little bit before we went on air. And you're one hell of a guy. I'm the, I'm going to say that you know off the bat, you're one hell of a guy. You're amazing. <laughs> And uh, I think this is going to be a very unique and good, <laughs> good interview. So, anyways, JB, uh, we like to start off things with uh, just asking the guest uh, who you are and what do you do. Okay, my name is JB Blanc. Uh, I'm an actor uh, and voice actor. Uh, I started in theatre in England, which gave me a good basis for 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 the career that I ended up having or am ending up having. <laughs> I don't think it's over quite yet, hopefully. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I, I, I moved to America when I did a movie called The Count of Monte Cristo, okay. which was a kind of Hollywood adaptation of a great British classic or a French classic. And I knew that wouldn't go over too well in England because we're very protective of our classics in <laughs> Europe. Uh, so I came over and had a look at the suggestion of the director, Kevin Reynolds, and, and, and thought sun, sunshine and palm trees and blue sky, I think I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, of course, had to start from scratch because I'd mainly done theater and, you know, a lot of casting directors at the time in L.A. were like, theater, how does that work? Um, and now they love theater actors much, much more. Um, and then and I, the first gig I got was, a, was an anime gig doing voiceover um, called Helsing, a series called Helsing. Oh. And uh, they were looking for British voices. And, and that's how I got my start in voiceover. I hadn't really done voiceover in the U.K. much. Um, and then uh, at the same time as my TV career was starting to kick, get going, games just kind of exploded onto the scene and I was in the right place at the right time. I could do a few silly voices um, and, uh, and the game thing kind of kicked off. Um, and yeah, I've done, I've done uh, I think it's something like 300 games um, and uh, 400 characters or something, maybe more. <laughs> Uh, I've kind of juggled, I juggle a TV career and a, and a, and a voice career and then uh, about probably... Eight years ago, I started directing, um, and I started. I, I was just handed uh, uh, Shadow of Mordor, which was a, a, a colossal video game that I that I voice directed. Uh, and from then on, it kind of it built from there. So I, I I did Shadow of Mordor, Shadow of War, Lego Batman, Lego Dimensions. Uh, then started working for Two K and did XCOM, directed that, directed Mafia Three. Uh, and then now I direct all of the stuff for Blizzard. So I do Overwatch and uh, Heroes of the Storm and Hearthstone and World of Warcraft wow. and Diablo and sometimes Starcraft. Uh, I direct Fortnite Save the World, which is the story mode behind Fortnite. And I also direct League of Legends and Legends of Runeterra, which is their digital card game. Right. So wow. uh, it's a busy, a, a busy life that I'm very, very grateful for. And uh, I juggle a lot. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's me. Wow. So, so yeah. Anyways, um, so so since you said all these things, um, which would you uh, at this point in time? Is it? Do you yeah. think it's like more video games, more anime, more TV shows, or is it like an even split uh, on what you do? I mean, mostly it's video games because of the directing. That's fairly consistent. I'm lucky because those companies, those three companies I mentioned, Blizzard, 2K, and Epic Games, they all kind of do rolling continuous updates. Um, <clears throat> so. I'm often I'm often in the studio. Right after this, I'll be going to Blizzard. I was there yesterday, um, and uh, we're doing the new World of Warcraft patch. Um, and uh, and so so day to day, that's kind of it's going to get more complicated because I start shooting a TV show in in uh, April. So that's going to throw another 
cat amongst the pigeons, as we say. Okay. Um, <laughs> but but I think most of my work is probably video game, and then it's dotted with bits of TV and and, and other stuff. Okay, and and um, is this uh, something that you expected to do? Because you know you said you were uh, uh, went into acting, but did you expect that you would shift into voice acting? Not at all. No, Not at all. There hasn't really been a shift. It's kind of I've 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 kept the both things going somehow. I mean, uh, so I think some people make that shift. The on-camera world can be very cutthroat and cruel. Um, <laughs> and nice thing about the voiceover world and why we all love love working in it, especially in games and animation, is because there isn't the same kind of degree of of cutthroat competition. We all understand how difficult it is. Um, it has nothing to do with the way you look, which is makes it a lot easier for a lot of people. Uh, it's less judgmental. And I think the people who do this well and often really understand just how difficult it is. I think uh, historically, I think a lot of people think that you walk into a booth and just talk, and there's a lot more that goes into it than that. Um, as you can tell from the, the way performances are developing, things are getting better as the technology gets better, the performances are becoming more naturalistic, more honest outside of the fantasy world. Um, and I think there's a, you know, there's a sort of misnomer that, that, uh, um, that it's an, that it's an easy life in some way. And, and sure, when you get to the top, it's easier, but you know, the, the, the closer you are to the top, the more you work and therefore the more you have to protect your voice and <laughs> juggle all the other stuff that you have to do. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, I don't dig ditches for a living, um, but, uh, <laughs> But, you know, there's a, there's a lot of rejection that goes with the acting business. There's a lot of no. You hear a lot of no, and you've got to have a thick skin and get through that and keep pushing on. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Now, I was just, I was just you know, curious uh, because when I was looking at your uh, list of, of your filmography or, you know, the list of th things that you've worked on, it's, wow, it's just like an endless list, you know? So, uh, and, and I noticed that, uh, as time went on, it was less on camera work and more, you know, voice voice over work. So, <clears throat> so let's, since you started in, in 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 film or on TV, I wanted to kind of just start on that first before we go move on to video games and and anime, which is which is to be honest, like the film stuff is probably our our weak point between me and Holly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, don't worry. So, uh, I know that you've been on Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Yeah. And can you uh, tell us a bit on uh, your work on, on those two shows? <clears throat> sure. Well, first of all, they cast me as a Mexican doctor and gave me lots of Spanish. And uh, I don't speak Spanish. Um, so, so that was interesting. Um, but it, it sort of, it's just sort of happened to me because I think I have uh, what I like to call stop me in the airport looks. Uh. Um you know, I look like a slightly dodgy villain. <laughs> um, uh, you know, being, being slightly darker and bearded, I think you can probably relate in Q8. Yeah. Uh, one gets those extra looks. Uh, I get a lot of castings with a lot of uh, Arab friends who are actors. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and sometimes I score the job, which is uh, embarrassing, um, but it's the way it happens. It's the industry, uh, yeah. But... but um, when I started on Breaking Bad, I think I came in on season four. And, it, you know, it's just a very small part. But um, the show was, there was buzz about the show, but it wasn't such a big deal. By the time I shot the first episode of season five, uh, it was a huge deal. And I suddenly realized that I was part of something, you know, very big and very magical. And it was a very happy set, a very fun place to work. And that's largely because Brian Cranston is just such an amazing guy. He's very... Um, very encouraging, very kind, uh, very supportive, and uh, doesn't really have much of an ego, which is rare in television. Um, so I, I just had a tremendous time. Aaron Paul, an amazing, amazing yeah. guy. I spent a lot of time with Jonathan Banks, who plays Mike Ehrmantraut, who is literally one of the nicest people in the business. Uh, you'll come off set and he'll be in his, you know, his his chair and he'll leap up and say, you, you've been working. Yeah, come, come sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. I'm like, who are you? Um, and uh, I've had some very good heart-to-heart -heart conversations with Jonathan. And he's he's a really good guy. And then I've been very fortunate in that they found a little niche for me in, in Better Call Saul. And I, I seem to do like one or two episodes a season. 
which is great to keep in touch with that kind of family. You know, I come from theatre, and and in theatre, in in uh, I did a lot of theatre in the UK. In theatre, you work for very short periods of time, very intensively with these people, and they become your family. It's extremely, uh, it's a cr- extremely close knit community. And I think sometimes doing television, I do a lot of guest stars where I turn up as the dodgy foreigner and usually get killed. Um, and uh, you don't get that same camaraderie. You don't get that same feeling of, of uh, a, a sort of a group mentality of working towards something together. And I think, you know, coming to directing and voiceover, I feel very much part of the team and very much part of the collaboration. And I like that. I like working with other people towards an end goal. Um so so that show was you know it's been great and and uh it's uh it's helped me start poking my nose into other little places so um now we're going to start on a, a show called barry which is uh, a very funny very dark show uh and of course i'm playing a chechen mob boss go figure so you're always the villain huh? always, <laughs> always, always the bridesmaid never the bride isn't that the same <laughs> So yeah, I actually I haven't watched Barry yet, but I did hear good things about it because it's, it's about like a hitman and um, who has like some moral issues, I think, or something like that. I forgot. He's an ex, he's an ex soldier. He he fought over in your neck of the woods, as many of our <laughs> boys have, whether we wanted them to or not. Right. Uh, and uh, and we're not going to get political. No, no. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to try really hard not to get political. No, because... If you want to, it's fine. <laughs> right. don't, don't worry. I, I don't believe me. Um, but uh, so he's a, yeah, he's this soldier um, with some haunting memories of his past. And, and really all he's good for when he comes back is being a hitman. But he has this moral dilemma about doing it. Who knew a hitman with a conscience? And uh, he, he uh, I think, I th- as I remember, a hit gets put out on an actor who hasn't paid his debts. And he ends up in the actor's acting class chasing him down. And through the course of this acting class, he falls in love with acting and decides that his way out of being a hitman is to become an actor. Um, and, you know, he falls in love with a girl that's in the class as well. It's all very classic. It's all there's some there's a, a kind of very theatrical teacher who's, you know, largely teaching because he failed as an actor, which is another truism in the business. Uh, not always true, but sometimes true. Um, and and uh, he also gets involved with these Bolivian and Chechen gangsters, and it all gets very complicated, and he can't get out of being a hitman, and that's the kind of premise of the show. Okay. But it has this very dark sense of humor, and it's it's very funny, and um, and uh, I'm really looking forward it's, to it. It's on HBO, I turned right? up end of season two, but I'm looking forward to getting started on it. It's on HBO, correct? It's on HBO. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. You're going to have and, to find a way to watch that. Then. No, we, we do. It's on OSN in the really? Middle East. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right, uh, it's, it's already uh, broadcast in uh, the Middle East, oh, uh, the show Barry on, on right. OSN. On the only and it stage has three letters as its name. It broadcasts on all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, just talking about you know TV shows here in the Middle East, uh, for many, 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 not even years, decades, you know, we were kind of neglected as the, this market. So, um, like TV show, I mean, movies was uh, fairly consistent in release because you know it's like a big, it's a much bigger deal than TV. But for as far as TV shows, man, I I remember we used to get some stuff like months or even years after even you know broadcast, yeah. and uh, not because <clears throat> there was no appetite for it, but just people in the West just didn't think about this market at all. And madness. And, 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 and it's crazy because, you know, if you know anything about the Middle East, you know, we have, you know, high GDP, we know we have, we're flush with cash and everything. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, JB, I just want to tell you something about my own personal experience in this kind of industry when I talk to people about my work. So I'm primarily in video games. Um, <clears throat> and when I talk to people about, you know, hey, you know, we have a gaming expo in Kuwait, we would like you to come, whether they're a company, a person, um, a famous person, whatever, what have you. They're like, wait, you guys have electricity over there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. Like, th- yeah. this, is, this is like I am being political right now with the things that people have, have told me. And, oh, yeah, I believe it. I and, believe it. And uh, in, in, uh, we, we celebrate our 10 years, uh, 2020, since you know, I started doing, doing this. And only until I would say, like, so I started in 2010, 
only up till like 2017 is when things started turning around for me. And when I talk to people about coming to Kuwait, they, they don't say, oh, are we going to get kidnapped and die or, or what, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, just, just, so just remember, people don't read the newspapers. They don't do that here. They think the same thing about Eastern Europe. You know, they probably think they're probably wondering whether the Czech Republic has electricity. I mean, it's 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 shameful. But relax, you're with someone who reads the news, who has been to the Middle East, uh, who who understands. And listen, look at the numbers. The, it's the fastest growing market on the planet right now exactly. for video games. Um, exactly. So, uh, you know, they're lost. They're lost, I mean, man. I mean, it's it, because, you know, you have to also th see it from my point of view, because uh, like, let's say eight out of 10 meetings that I had, it would it would be uh, about talking about like safety and and technology if, if, like the sp specific technology is available in the country or whatever. N they never really ask about you know the important stuff like how many people do do they attend your expo? How many? Uh, I mean, do you know that for like many years? You know, for electricity, we just rub two rocks together <laughs> and <laughs> a spark and we can run video game. It's amazing. <laughs> You don't exactly, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> Very special rocks, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, because it it made me look bad. Because then people would think that oh, people don't don't want to attend over there because you know the expo itself is you know bad or whatever. But you have to think that for many years I've been doing a game expo without any game companies, yet. I would have thousands of attendees attend, and that should be like a big, you know, like green flag to all of them. I exactly, like if if people in the thousands are attending a game show without any game companies even being present, <laughs> then what, that what what yeah. the hell is going to happen if they actually do, you know, show up? So, so yeah, it was it was crazy. But you know, when when you were uh, say, talking about you know the TV shows and stuff, only I would say. Um, six or seven years ago in the Middle East is when we started getting uh, TV shows literally the, the day or the day after it premieres in mm. Europe and the US. Yeah, so it, well, I mean, I mean, that used to be that used to be true with Europe as well. We used to always be like six months behind. We, right. They would release a film here and then six months later, it would get, <laughs> I think the internet changed all of that because everyone could blow the plot of the film Ex by, yeah. by sending an email. Yeah. <laughs> So, so they started having to, you know, and it was, you know, had a bigger impact because you're doing a global launch instead of just one, right. one country. Um, but also, I, I, I agree with you, and I think it's, it's a. I mean, I, I don't think it was a governmental thing. It wasn't censorship, was no, it no, particularly? No. Exactly. And Kuwait is is one of the more open countries over it there is. in terms of it in is. terms of that, you know, allowing that kind of material in. So I, I think it's, you know. Uh, dare I say it, the arrogance of the West? It's not. It's not something we're new to. <clears throat> um, but you know, people people don't realize, and I think you know that's why I think America has been caught napping uh, as far as the development in India and China has gone. I've yeah. traveled in both places, and I traveled uh, in the '90s in those places, and they are very, very different now. Uh, those countries have burgeoned, and America was was you know sleeping. Right. Um, so whatever effects that it has on our economy is kind of, you know, something that we asked for by yeah, overlooking that. Yeah. You know, um, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm tremendously excited. I, I get a lot of contact from the Middle East. Uh, you, you, there's a lot of fandom there and, and uh, it's tremendously exciting. I think it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for everyone to, 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 to do better. Yeah, actually, uh, talk about fandom. I just want to, um... Uh, mention uh, about you know how fans there's like so many fans in the Middle East even though there's like no official presence of the, the actual companies in the Middle East so um, a couple of years ago yeah, they, 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 told, they told me that like four people are watching this right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> that's true but um, the, uh, the, the uh, a couple of years ago we were chosen by Square Enix. I'm sure you know you've you've done work with them. Uh, I'm familiar with they, them. They chose us as the first expo that they attend in the Middle East, and they also um, uh, they they also uh, were kind of just had you know they were a bit worried about you know do we really have fans over there and that kind of stuff. I mean they knew they had fans. They just didn't know how big of the fan base was. So one of the directors of Final Fantasy attended. 
and there was a constant non-stop line of fans waiting, like having him sign Final Fantasy games even if he didn't even work on them. So I believe it. So after the expo finished, you know, I had a meeting with them and everything, and they were like, what the hell just happened? I'm like, what? <laughs> and like, they're like, we have so many fans here. I'm like, yes, I've been telling you this for years. <laughs> so I had to wait, wave them under your nose before you realize. Yeah, and then, and then what happened is uh, they were just like so happy. They were like, listen, listen, we're so sorry that, you know, it took us so much, t so much time to finally come to you and, you know, listen to you and everything. But listen, you don't have to explain anything anymore to us, you know. We're, we're part of this. We want to be here. And last year, Square, because, you know, the, because Square Enix attended in 2018, uh, it was the first time. In 2019, they made me do the first official Final Fantasy concert in the Middle East. So that was like, you know, a big deal. And then in 2020, they also planned to come again. Like they were like, you don't, you don't have to, to contact us anymore. We're the ones who are going to contact you to tell you, you know, if there's like space to come. So, Isn't but, that but, interesting? But, but I, I, I wish that happened, you know, a long time ago, not like two years ago. <laughs> but of course, hey, but you know what, you know, it, it takes what time it takes. Yeah, you, know, it, I, it, I, you know, I... <laughs> The first, God, five years of my career, I ate rice doing theater for no money. And, you know, occasionally homeless. Uh, you know, literally, you know, just, just, I used to sleep at the theater sometimes. Wow. Because uh, I just, that's, I was, that's what I wanted to do. And you've, you've, tenacity is everything. You've held on and you've, you've believed that it would work. You knew that they had that audience. And now they're eating out of your hand, and that's that's as it should be. And you've earned that respect. And it does kind of feel better having been through that. If everything had come easily, I yeah. don't know that I'd, I'd be as you know as as happy or as confident in my work as I am now. I've seen the bottom of the barrel. Right. I right. don't need. To, I don't need to go back down there. And and it, it reminds <laughs> you, you know, where you came from, and 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 how you you know rose, and and not only that, but. I honestly do feel like I've gained the respect of the people that, you know, the people that I've worked with because they've seen, you know, the struggle that I had, you know, to go through. But anyways, like... Well, they probably, in, probably, they probably haven't met you in person, that's but, why. Right, yeah, I'm an asshole in person. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but anyways, like, enough of the negative stuff, you know, let's let's focus on sure. the, the more positive, <laughs> more positive well, stuff. Yeah. So, um, so you so we talked a little bit about TV shows that you've worked on, like such as uh, Breaking Bad and uh, and Barry, uh, but you've also d done film as well, like movies. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. uh, I saw that you've done uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, but I, I yeah. think that's like a small part or something, right? Tiny one line. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I did. The, there was a favor to a casting director. A casting director called me up and said, "Listen, we've got this part that's come up. Can you come in on Thursday?" And I was like, "Sure." <laughs> So, uh, you know, so I like, put on a I, 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 I'm shave. Always, I'm always kind of curious about these roles because, like, like is it is it that common to have people, not extras, but because, like, extras are usually, like, just background stuff, correct? Yeah. So, but, like, is, is it very common to have uh, actors come on, on movies just for, like, a sentence or two? Is that, is that a very common thing? All those parts need filling, yeah. Wow. All those parts need filling. Um, and you can't exactly call it a cameo because, you know, no one really knows who I am. The, yeah. the, the, what I get is, do I know you? Oh, did you? Did you? Do you know Johnny? And I go like, no, I don't know Johnny. And I know they've seen me on something, but it's kind of it's kind of the um, the bane of being the eternal guest star on television is that, Oh, you're that guy from that thing that was, I, mm, you know, people just come up and stare and it takes them like 10 minutes to realize it's the Count of Monte Cristo or something like that. Um, so, yeah, no, those are all very valid, valid parts. And they, they're, they're all SAG roles, Screen Actors Guild roles. They need to be filled. And there are, you know, there are 70,000 actors uh, who can be cast in those roles. Um I've, I've, I, it's very difficult as I've grown in the industry, it's very difficult to say no, because I, I was never able to say no in my past. I was like, yes, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. Uh, you know, you come out of drama school and you're like commercials. No, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do commercials. And then after about three years of eating, you know, chips, you're like, I'll, I'll do, I'll do a commercial tomorrow. I will do it. I will, I will do an underwear. I will do a sexual disease commercial tomorrow. <laughs> 
things change when you suddenly have children and bills. Um, uh, but no, no, those are all very valid roles. And you know, background is kind of categorized as a different entity. They're, 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 it's a, it's they're hired under a different contract, a back to background performance contract, and I don't think they get residuals and stuff like that. Um, but there are many small roles and, you know, during the course of filming, they'll have overlooked something. And, you know, this was right at the end of the shoot for Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Um, they'd actually asked me to come in. <laughs> this was crazy, but they asked me to come in because, uh, they were missing a couple of actors for a camera rehearsal for the big Skull Island meeting in that movie where all the pirate Kings meet up and, um, Keith Richards, had fallen out of a tree. I don't know if you remember this news story. He'd fallen out of a tree because he's Keith Richards. Yeah. Um, he'd fallen out of a tree and broke his arm or something. So I, I was Keith Richards for the day. Oh. And I, I, I walk into the studio, they put me on set, and Johnny Depp is standing on my left and Jeffrey Rush is standing on my right. And suddenly I'm like, this is how your life can change, you know? Right, right, uh, right. I, I spent a great day um, chatting to Johnny Depp. He was living in France at the time. I'm French originally. We had a great chat. Um, and and I hung out with him all day, uh, and met all that all that cast and stuff. And of course, the next day, I'm sort of you know picking up my dog's poop back in Eagle Rock, <laughs> California, thinking life is weird. <laughs> life is very strange. Like yesterday, me and Johnny hanging it out, being cool, and now it's dog shit. <laughs> and, and, and that is the reality of this business <laughs> unfortunately. That kind of encapsulates it rather well. So uh, so I helped out with the camera rehearsal. Uh, and and then we did a reading of the script for the third Pirates movie or the, or the second Pirates movie. I can't remember which one. Um, just to see if the script was working. And so and then this this part, you know, they clearly hadn't cast the one line clerk. Uh, and uh, and the casting director called me up and said, I've, "We've got this role. It's just come up. We need it's one line. Can you can you come in and do it for the day?" Um, and so that, that's a no-brainer. Absolutely, I'll happily do that. You know, and, it's and one of the I biggest. Just, I just had like a, just a, I don't need. I don't need you to go to like any specifics. Just like it's just a general question, but um, it's just like a, a yes or no question. Uh, like that small part that you mentioned that in Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm just from what I know of uh, the film industry. There's a lot of. Uh, contracts and red tape and uh lawyers and everything I even for like a small ro role like that is it like you have to go through like a lot of hurdles in terms of like contracts and agents and stuff or is it kind of more um easy to uh all of that's still involved all of, i mean the negotiation is not a negotiation because you're a day player right right and they'll say we've got this and you say yes or no so it's, um, it's usually done like very quick for like small roles like that. That's that's what I was trying to yeah, get. Well, yeah, I think so. Well, and also, I, you know, I found out I was doing it like the day before or, or two days before. <laughs> so you you know, and that, it's not like I have to get deep into a role right. or anything like that. No, it's got one line. Uh, I think the line was "No, sir, executions." Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That, I, mm, smell that? It's Oscar. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so you know there there are big gigs and there are small gigs, right, but but right, right. you know you just don't, you don't want to give any less attention to the smaller gigs just because they're small. My, right. It's not my job as an actor. My job as an actor is to help tell that story, no matter how big or small the part. Um, but in terms of paperwork, it's probably the same amount of paperwork. Oh really? That, that's yeah. that's what I was trying to get at. Like, is is the amount of paperwork the same for a small role as as a big role? That's what I was kind of. Yeah. Okay, Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, you might, if in a big role, you might have more of an interest in the movie. If there's, if you're very big, you might have a percentage point in the right, movie. Right. Um, and that's that's more complex contract work, and that you'd right. need a lawyer for. I don't really need a lawyer for a day player thing. Uh, my agent handles all of that. They've seen a million contracts. The contracts are kind of standardized. Right. Uh, right. And it's a straightforward offer. Right. And just you know, also there's there's less negotiation these days, just because the corporations have become so big. Uh, it's much more of a take it or leave it. Uh, world now. I mean, you know, if you were doing a television pilot 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you could get maybe 30, 40, 50,000 an episode. Now they'll start offering you 10, 12, wow. um, which, you know, that sounds like a lot of money, but if you haven't worked for the previous three years, it doesn't balance out very well, you know, and that right, can happen. Right. So, um, and the other problem that I want to talk about is this, is that, you know, a lot of the work has left L.A. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of filming going on in, in Vancouver and, and New Orleans and uh, even New York. Uh, um, Atlanta has become this great hub now. And, you know, Tyler Berry's just built a whole studio complex out there. Yeah. 
So it, it, for the for the middle scale actor, which is kind of the slot I fit into, you know, it's I'm lucky to get Barry because that shoots in L.A. at Paramount Studios. That's one of the few shows that does. You look at Vancouver, there are 50 shows shooting yeah, in Vancouver Canada right now. Canada has a lot. Yeah. It's a tremendous amount. And I have friends who are production designers and crew, and it's it's hard to get crew because everyone's taken on these other shows. So the, the business is constantly evolving, and the voiceover business too. Um, the great thing is that the game industry seems to be recession-proof. It seems to just build and build and build. And, uh, you know, when explosive games like Fortnite and, uh, and, and, uh, and Apex Legends come out, they take over the world. Right. Uh, and I'm very lucky that, Someone thought it would be a crazy idea if I did some of that. So, so I'm actually I'm going to get to Apex Legends in a little bit. I want to keep the video game stuff for for the end of the interview. But I wanted Absolutely. to move so, now uh, from from uh, from the movies and TV to anime, and I'm going to turn that over to Ali because he's he's more into the anime scene than I am. Just so you have an idea of like my my knowledge of anime. I'm a very old school anime person. I like the the anime robots from like the 70s and 80s all uh, right <laughs> wow uh, you're deep nerd yeah yeah that, no that's that's the <laughs> stuff i like and they don't really make that stuff anymore so i kind of just oh. i just kind of lost interest i don't really watch m much anime anymore but ali though he's a huge you know anime person he he still watches anime so he's gonna ask you uh more of the anime questions but uh just to kind of transition uh can you just tell us how you started into anime and then i'll let uh, Ali, continue the rest. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it was shortly after I arrived in Los Angeles in 2001, which, if you remember, was... Uh, I, I arrived... Uh, crazy story. I stopped in New York on the way over to see friends, uh, did some tourist stuff, actually went up one of the Twin Towers, and 10 days later, 9-11 happened. Wow. But that's the next... Yeah, that's the negative stuff. So 9-11 happened right after I got to LA. Wow. Which meant the release of the Count of Monte Cristo got pushed and I was knocking around going, uh, shit, what am I going to do? And then uh, a British friend of mine said they were looking for British voices in a little anime called Helsing. And did I want to meet them? And I said, sure, you know, anything for a buck. And so I, I, I didn't know anything about anime. I'd, I'd never really seen any anime. I, 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 to, to say that I had no idea what I was doing would not be an exaggeration. Um, <laughs> But I'd had this good theatre training, so hopefully that made me adapt adaptable. And um, they gave me a little role in Helsing. And, and after Helsing, it was there was a it was a company called New Generation Pictures, and they had a, a few things going on. And I think I did uh, I, some of the names are gonna I'm gonna miss them, but I My Me Strawberry Eggs. I directed something called Licensed by Royal. That was a, a that was my first dub direction which was a very odd Japanese series about a, a kind of based on James Bond and very kind of Englishy, um, but was so confusing that I had to get the ending retranslated into Japanese and have someone else tell me what the hell was going on because I couldn't work it out, which is often the case. In it's, it's very much that's Japanese stuff for you. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like, hang on a second. <laughs> Sometimes their enthusiasm gets the, gets the best of them. I just did a convention in Japan, actually, and it was amazing because because, you know, usually they're very protective over Japanese um, voice output and stuff, and so it was great for them to have American voice actors over there. Uh, but that that was that was it was it was sort of out of necessity, and 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 you know I think in life you have to remain curious, and and I'm always this is a job you never figure out how to do. You're always 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 learning, and there's so many different aspects of the of the job that you can explore. And so Helsing just kind of landed on my plate, and I went, what is this weird and wonderful world of anime? And then on the back of that, I went to my first convention, and the first question I was ever asked at a convention, <laughs> let me see if I've got a prop, <laughs> was this. Um, Mr. Blanc, um, I, I know you've done lots of film and television and theater, but um, what makes you think you can do anime? <laughs> And that was my welcome to the anime fandom world. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that's an example of an anime fan. It's one example of an anime yeah, yeah. fan. <laughs> um, it's not the example of an anime fan. But I knew I was in with a tough crowd at that point. And it was gonna be, I was going to be judged and it was going to be a baptism of fire. And you know, my answer was, I'm a storyteller. It is my job to adapt to whatever medium I'm telling that story in, be it film, television, voiceover, animation, uh, a commercial. It doesn't matter. Um, my job is to adapt to that particular genre. Right, so I right. did my homework on anime and I did research, you know, 
uh, how the, the performance ethic is slightly different, and, and I learned how to do this, which happens a lot in anime. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Japanese yeah. startle. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I adapted to, 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 to do my job, which is to help tell whatever story is put in front of me. So that's a kind of, I kind of, you know, it was like osmosis. And at the same time, um, I think I scored my first video game and, and that started to kick off. And it just, the video game world kicked off very quickly. And uh, I continued to do anime for a while. I mean, I was in Naruto for 15 years, 16 years. I was in Bleach for 15 years. You know, those were, you know, 800, 900 episodes of, of anime. Um, you, you get some mileage under your belt. And, and anime is an amazing place to cut your teeth as a voice actor. The irony of anime is it's some of the most difficult stuff to do because you're working to Japanese lip flap. And so you're working with an adaptation that isn't the original Japanese. It's an adapted version that hopefully has been fit inside the mouths of these characters. But it can be hit and miss. You're often rewriting on the fly. And, you know, getting that timing absolutely right is a, is a skill in itself. Um, the sad thing is, it's the least paid work you can do as a voice actor. Uh, just because anime companies just don't have that much money. You know, it's, it's a niche market. It's a big market, but it's a very heavily flooded market too, as you know, Ali. Yeah. So, uh, with that said, favorite show to work on during your time as uh, an anime voice actor because uh, as you've said you, you're not heavily working in that industry currently. no um i love doing roberto in monster because he was deliciously evil uh, um and I, I really have a soft spot for enrico maxwell in in helsing because it was my first big you know anime role um, he's an absolute slime ball, so what's not to talk about that? Um, and he has this horrible, glorious uh, death where he's devoured by, spoiler alert, about 30 million zombies, um, vampire zombies. Uh, so, so, yeah, those are the ones that kind of stick out. Uh, you, it's good to have a run at something. You know, so much of what we do is often in and out, one, you know, a few lines here, a few lines there, and you're gone. Um, so to have something that was, you know, something I could work on over a long period of time, uh, that's great. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of challenge. True, true. And, uh, speaking about Maxwell, how did you come about finding his voice? Uh, the same way you do with, with a lot of things. I mean, I had an image to work with and, you know, he's got this very sharp nose and this very big grin and very, he's very sly. Uh, and they wanted they wanted this Italian accent, and they wanted to keep him really smooth, you know, like it's just you know the thing about evil is that you don't know that you're evil, <laughs> you're just trying to play, you know, and, and so uh, uh, an evil character is like a toddler who's trying to get his needs met. They throw their toys out of the pushchair, you know, they 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 spit their food out, uh, they they get upset when things don't go their way. But to them, they're not evil. They just want to. They just want to. Get Not done what they world. need to get yeah. done. So I think with those, it's a delicate balance with a, with a character like that. And I'm, you know, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm honestly quite a nice guy, but I seem to play all these really evil <laughs> bastards. Um, for a start, thank you, because they're much more fun to play. Right. <laughs> uh, but it's a fine balance between, you know, twirling your moustache and putting the cape over your eyes and, uh, and, and creating something that's tangible and real. And so you, you, what, you, you You've got a bit more leeway because anime is a bit more of a stylized delivery. Um, but you want to keep it real. I mean, it, it, voice acting is not really voice acting. It's acting. And the voice sort of comes second. It's all the internal stuff of how do I relate to this character? Um, how does he sound to me when I look at him and, and, and I look at the angles of his face? And he might be an orc. And so I might jut my jaw out and see how that changes my voice. And then you sound like an orc. You know, and so it's, you take on the sort of physicality of the character. That's usually the first instinct for me. And you're sort of, you're listening to the style of the piece, what the what the producers are looking for. Um, some come very easily, some are a little harder to find. Um, but the clue for me usually is, is the visuals. Uh, and then when I learn a bit about what a kind of backstabbing uh, slime ball <laughs> he is, that then 
you know, then I have to go, well, I can't play a backstabbing slime ball, but I can play a guy who comes off that way because of the ch decisions and choices he makes. Um, that he's always lurking in the background and he kind of drifts onto screen. And, that you know, that shows you that he's like this, you know, almost he's got a spies everywhere and he has this omnipresence. And so he can just show up at any time and just glide in and go, hello, Sirintegra. You know, <laughs> and you're like, oh, he's 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 not going to have anything good to say. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's 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 usually it's a visual uh, that helps me because I was a physical theater actor. I had a physical theater company in London or was part of one. And uh, uh, that for me has always been the key. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, a reference that keys it off. Sometimes. They say, you know, kind of like a replicant in Blade Runner, and you kind of go, oh, okay, I can, I understand that method of delivery. Um, and, you know, I mean, uh, I think, you know, Sean Penn would tell you, sometimes you put on a coat and it just feels right. Um, you don't have to necessarily do all that colonic travel to discover the, the nub of the part, you know what I mean? Sure. Sometimes it's obvious, and usually the image is the easiest thing to go off. I see you're credited as the English voice actor of uh, Sasori, who is uh, remarkably very different in his two forms. So yes. I, I, I can see only one form in uh, that credit. So could you explain what happened there? Uh, I think in the uh, I think the evil scorpion like form they wanted a much darker, deeper voice. And and something that was much easily much more easily irritable, so you get a lot of "I'm waiting for you, day da da," and that that's the kind of growl they were looking for. Uh, and I think it was Johnny Young Bosch who played the other form, um, and he's he's much he's much younger, much younger, lighter voice. So I think they were looking for the contrast, so you really know that it's a different character. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, younger younger voices. I mean, I can do it. It's it's okay, but it's not it's not quite the same as someone who's really young doing it, you know. Yeah. Um, and so so I I tend to get the the voice in the boots part of that, and I think that was just the decision that was made. Uh, did you know that he had the second uh, a secondary form when you started playing him? Oh, okay. I did. So that didn't come out of the blue. No. No, 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 no. All this stuff is very, very cal calculated. <laughs> and also remember, with the Japanese stuff, you know, you've got the manga coming out, and so people get a heads up as to what's going on. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, true, true. And, um, well, if we want to move away from villains, because I believe you played, uh, you played one of the captains in Bleach. The, uh, the yes, I played one of the good guys, the Sajin Komamura. Yeah, I actually took that role over from someone else who couldn't do it anymore. Um, and that is like walking into an anime death trap. Uh, because people are very loyal. They're yeah. very loyal to the person who played it before you. And, you know, I had to start doing, uh, kind of doing what Kim was doing, kind of almost voice matching. And then gradually the part became more my own. And because it's just different. I'm a different actor to the guy who originally played it. It's not like you're voice matching, you know, often, you know, in a film, you have to do ADR. So uh, during the shooting, a phone went off, a crow crowed, uh, some church bells happened, a car went past and it's supposed to be 1762. Uh, so they have to re-record some of the dialogue. And sometimes voice actors get br brought in because... You know, Russell Crowe's too busy to do his voice uh, work for an ADR. So uh, you'll come in and do Russell Crowe. Um, and, and, and people don't know that that's a voice actor actually matching him. So when you're taking over a role, you're usually asked to kind of match how it started. So for Komamura, I had to do that. And then gradually over the years, I could, I could make it a bit more, more my own. But you get some stick, you know. Oh, Kim was much better. Oh, Jamie's rubbish at this. Da, da, da. Who is this guy? And then you get people who go, I love the new Common War. It's amazing, you know. I, you know, I, uh, you know, it, it, in game stuff, it's the same thing, you know. It's, it's, I do Kano in, in Mortal Kombat uh, 11. And, you know, a, a lot of other people, most of whom are very good friends of mine, have played Kano before. <laughs> Uh, but this time I was chosen. I don't know why. I didn't choose me. They chose me. Uh, <laughs> 
and I, I, it's my duty to put my spin on it and see if that works. And fortunately, it seems to have. Some people, you know, there are haters, and there are people who love it. So it, it's risky, man. What we do is thrown out into the into the into the world, and the danger of the internet is that if you give people uh, the opportunity to have an opinion, they might actually have one, <laughs> <laughs> and they're very clear in expressing it. <laughs> So, you know, there there are other risks to the business. I ain't getting shot at, but in a way, right, right, Twitter has bullets too. Right, right, right. <laughs> Since uh, you brought up games, would you uh, could you talk about what it was like uh, getting ready and uh, actually doing work on uh, Apex Legends, and then my producer can uh, get sure. Uh, well, you know, uh, Respawn is a company that I've worked for quite a bit over the years, and I love working for them. They seem to like working with me. Um, what was interesting was, I think it started with really with me playing uh, Cuban Blisk uh, in Titanfall, Titanfall 1 and 2. Um, and he's like this South African, you know, hard nice bastard guy. Uh, it's got a really strong Afrikaans accent. Although they tried to make it a little bit easier to understand, um, but he's just this—he's just this nasty piece of work, and I loved playing with him. And then he became central to Titanfall 2, and even more of a bastard. And then they used him to sort of set up the Apex Legends. They had a little video where I'm, he's sitting in the bar, which we did in motion capture, uh, and coming out with those lines with, you know, uh, "You kill me, you're better. I'll kill you." I'm better. I remember that line. I Which remember is kind of a that great, line. It's kind of a great line. Yeah. It's kind of a great line. I think he'd said it somewhere in Titanfall 2. And then Titanfall that was the bridge. Yeah. And suddenly they came to me and said, listen, there's this uh, this character Caustic. I can't remember whether I auditioned for it. I think they just I think they just had me in for it. Which is extremely flattering. Uh, and Caustic was this very different character. He's much more cerebral. He's a scientist. He's obsessed with death. He's extremely negative. But in a very dry and funny way. And that immediately was interesting to me. You know, a one-dimensional character, a two, two-dimensional flat character is, is not that interesting. That's why, you know, the heroes might get more lines, but the villains get the more juicy lines. Right, and, right, and right, they, right. They get the better stuff to play. And so that's always much more interesting because it's like, you know... What's someone? What someone who uh, you know? What's behind someone eating a ham sandwich is not that interesting. What's uh, behind someone wanting to eat a child? Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So that's a rather crude illustration, perhaps. But uh, I please uh, no, we don't try it. that. Do not eat children at home. No. That is not. This is this was a this was a train driver on a closed course. Um, <laughs> But uh, so 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 when 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 that came up, and you know what, playing a villain who's so gentle and subtle and dark, and and I f I found this kind of obsessive, intelligent tone of voice that says, you know, the 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 more I live, the the more I'm drawn towards my death, and it just feels kind of hollow and scary and. And what drives this guy? What is it? And you learn about a bit about his history. And, you know, again, they asked me in. We found the voice together. It stuck and it continues to stick. And I'm extremely grateful for it. Um, but also it's like you can't approach it like, oh, I'm going to play this big bad villain in this game. It's going to be really fun. And, I, you know, it's not that. It's who is the guy? Who is this guy? That's what got me into acting is, is why do human beings make the choices they make? What's great about the game world is that we've gone deeper into that kind of psychology behind characters. If you listen to early voiceover in video games, whew, there's some honkers out there. There's some, yeah. there's some, you yeah. know. But the the technology was crude. It was jerky. It wasn't. You couldn't play it on your phone. We didn't have phones. We didn't have any bandwidth. Um, these were things that you played on your hard drive. There was no connectivity. Um, so they would get Gene from Accounts to do a voice. And so you get voiceover like, oh, they did. They oh did. look, they did. oh, look, a door. We must go now. And you're like, <laughs> oh, my God. You remind me of so many bad voice acting in, in games I and anime. I love you. And I'm mad at you at the same time. 
And you're like, who? What? What are these people thinking? <laughs> um, I but that was, an intro. that's been uh, completely butchered when it was uh, done. Dr. Wowie is. Uh... <laughs> So, and there's, a, there's some website called like voiceatrocities.com or something, and some of the you know early Silent Hill. Some of them are, they're really, but you know they they got a they got a bloke they, they gave the janitor do a few lines. Uh, a lot of these companies weren't unionized. They didn't realize that performance was going to be necessary in their games because who knew where it was going to go? You couldn't really. People said they knew, but they didn't really know. Um, and then once you know, once the internet blows up, and you, you, suddenly you can do very naturalistic performances. You need better writers. You need better directors. You need better actors. The whole technology thing changes. Uh, we started doing motion capture, which allowed for very detailed, very intimate performances. The irony is that to do motion capture, what you really need is theatre skills. So this art form that is two thousand years old is informing this art form that is two seconds old. Right, right. You right. know, and they're the same techniques that make it work. And people who hadn't done theatre found it a lot more difficult to do to do motion capture because there is a consciousness of movement that only a physically well trained actor can really do well. Um, so, so it's it's fascinating the way this world has developed so so quickly, and and it's changed. The other thing is that. I think a lot of game companies, the way a game works is you have a certain, people know this, but you have a central engine, usually the Unreal Engine, which is owned by Epic Games, and people license that engine, and they plug in their own functionality of what they want their game to do. And I think a lot of game companies used to think that voice was just another piece of functionality that you plugged in, and you said, well, we've got all these lines, let's just add voices to them, we'll right, throw right. these voices at them. And I think they quickly realized that that wasn't enough, if you really want the story, and that, that gamers actually cared about story. There was a huge myth that no one really gave a damn who was in the video game. No one really gave a damn whether the voice acting was. No, these people wanted immersive experience. And the voiceover and the performances, that's what contributes, as well as all this amazing, amazing work that all these engineers do, which is, I take my hats off to them because it's phenomenal what's achievable now. And you look at the detail. I just had a tour of Respawn. The amount of people, you know, uh, a room full of a hundred guys, each with a section of the game, just playing it over and over again to make sure that that bug is fixed. Endless, endless work going in. Um, it's really amazing, but the voice is there to assist in the telling of that story, and, and the deeper the characters get, the deeper the story gets, the more important that is. No, I mean, I remember the first time, I mean, the first time I played a video game and I was really impressed with the voice acting was in 1998, and that was for Metal Gear Solid. Uh, All right, yeah. Because they actually did try to have a budget for the the voice acting, and <laughs> and I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I'm sure you know because you've you've worked on Revengeance, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, you know uh, about Kojima, and he's like, he loves about you know storytelling, and he considers himself more Hollywood than video games and and all that stuff. Um, but I wanted to kind of just uh, get back to uh, Apex Legends and Titanfall because uh, I uh, bought Titanfall two uh, kind of by accident. Uh, what I, what I mean well, your, is, your credit I, card just slipped out of your wallet and jumped into <laughs> no, the cash. No, hand. It wasn't like that. Yeah, it that's was... how I bought my really fast motorbike too. <laughs> it just happened. I didn't, sorry. I, uh. No, it was it was um, it was it came out in a time where I was looking for something new to play and I didn't know what to get. And then I was reading online that there's like this new game that's that's out. That's by the the develop the the ex developers of Call of Duty and Medal of Honors and, and I mean I knew who Respawn was at the time I just didn't really care sure. about Titanfall one, especially since sure. it was like an Xbox uh, exclusive, and yeah. um, they said, listen, the, the 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 story is so amazing in Titanfall two and they have all this like free DLC and you should you should support them just because of that, so. I literally bought the game just to support the developers. Like my intention was, my intention was because I, I knew their history. I, I know what, you know, Vince Paula did in the past and everything. So I just bought the game. I said, hey, you know, it's going to be like a FPS game. I'm just going to play it a little bit and then, you know, just move on to the next game. And then 
while I was playing it, and you might disagree with me on this, I didn't really care too much about the story. Like, I was like, I don't know where, like, this thing that I'm supposed to be, like, you know, emotionally connected to because that's, like, what I, what I was told online. But then I said, hey, let me try the multiplayer. And then it was like, you know, just like heroin injected into me. It was so addictive. And not just addictive, it was so good because it has to be good to be addictive. You know, it can't just be addictive by, you know, by itself. I remember, oh, yeah, you don't want old shitty heroin. You wouldn't good stuff. <laughs> and I remember I, I called up my friend who I routinely play, you know, online video games with. And I was like, man, you got you to gotta buy this game. Like, don't, don't listen to people telling you about the story and the campaign and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's okay. But it's the multiplayer, man. The multiplayer is amazing. And Sick. me yeah. and him would be playing, you know, multi, like, like four, five, six hours a day, you know, for Titanfall 2. And then I heard about Apex Legends. So it was a no-brainer for me from, you know, coming from Titanfall 2. Like, these are the guys that did Titanfall 2. At the very least, I should try it because, you know, uh, it has to be based on the same, you know, gameplay and, and that kind of stuff. And then next thing you know, it just blew up. So my, my, I, I don't really want to talk about, you know, the, the game as a gameplay, but were you expecting that? Like when you, because, because you've already worked with them before, like on Titanfall 1 and Titanfall 2. And, you know, the sales were like, you know, bad to average or whatever. But did you expect Apex to be the, 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 the thing that Monster it became? No. No, not at all. <laughs> I mean, for a start, what do I know? <laughs> um, but uh, I, listen, I think Titanfall 2 was a sleeper hit. It was. It was. It, people weren't noticing, and then suddenly it kind of, and then you kind of, you notice that you're getting more attention, and then, you know, I think, you know, what freaks, what freaks a lot of game fans out is that, wait a second, the guy who plays that Mexican doctor is also Cuban Blisk? <laughs> I can't compute that. It, they just don't believe. I don't, people don't understand what actors do, and I, it, why should they? They, you know, it's not a process that's that's that people are party to or get to witness. Um, but when you start noticing that kind of attention, there's a buzz, and you think, oh, that's interesting. Then when you go and meet Respawn, and they say, so we're going to take that, and we're going to do this. Um, you get a feeling that something interesting might be about to happen. You can never guarantee success. Right, this is a right. fickle business, and some things that people think are going to succeed flop badly. And that's true of film, television, and anything else. But you get an inkling. And then when that happened, and I think in the first... I mean, it did... it did Because I was already directing Fortnite Save the World, ironically. Um, but it did bigger numbers than Fortnite in the first month. Right. Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the the growth. Right. Now Fortnite, I think uh, Fortnite and Overwatch had sort of laid the path for those kind of arena games. And uh, but this was something else. This was sometimes you know these guys went about it by creating a series of characters, all of whom were interesting, all of whom were well written, all of whom were distinctive. They went about it in the right way, and. When I saw the script, I was like, oh, this is different. This is good. This is, you know, for my, for, just for my character, I just thought they've thought about this really carefully and they've written the hell out of it. This could be interesting. I don't think you ever expect the kind of explosion that happened with, with, with Apex. Right, it was yeah. massive, massive and very quickly. And uh, I think they reached, you know, uh, uh, 50 million players or, 100, or, or, or even like the first 10 million players in faster than any other game had ever done. Right, right. Of that nature, because it's a subscription, a subscription effectively format. So no, you don't really have any idea, um, and and really, it's not my job to have that idea. My job is just to play that character as truthfully as I possibly can, and hopefully create something interesting. Well, as soon as it comes out, and you know, Twitter goes nuts, you, you then you know you're onto something. But then it's a responsibility to maintain that. Right. You know. Uh, I go in for sessions on on Caustic every few months. They update a little bit more, there's a little bit more dialogue. I have to maintain that 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 quality and, and keep the fans happy. Um, I have to not think about that. I have to keep them happy by just doing the job as right, well as right. I possibly can and playing that character as as truthfully and as loyally as I possibly can. But you can, there are no guarantees. You never know. You never know. And I mean, I'm just looking at. Uh, Something I said just activated Siri, so I'm just going to shut her up. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> I'm Siri, leave me alone. 
So yeah, I, I just saw someone in chat say one of your lines, I do not care who makes the kill as long as I can obso- observe it die. <laughs> I do not care who makes the kill as long as I can observe it die. <laughs> you know, I I was uh, the only reason i was against choosing caustic as a as a as a uh, oh here we go here we go here's where the loyalty breaks off no 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 when a guest comes to your show you go you're supposed to say i only ever play caustic he's amazing god you're so amazing <laughs> you're a god <laughs> No, no, the, it was it was um i don't really play uh free-to-play games so to me playing a free-to-play game is ver- i have i have dilemmas playing free-to-play games and what i mean by that is i always feel because honestly i think in my whole life i think i've only played uh five or six free-to-play games ever i think so it's like very very little you know and um i always feel like if i spend my you know resources on like this character or this thing then i won't have resources to spend on something else or whatever so i i end up i end up being in a loop of not getting anything (laughs) at all you know i understand (laughs) so caustic was one of those characters you know locked you know behind like you had to like uh have credits or whatever to unlock him but I remember. You, you got to work hard for this shit, man. This is gonna- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but what I did like was because, you know, in Apex Legends, you can go and like unlock uh, uh, voice, uh, voice uh, commands and stuff like that for the characters. And I would love just to go through Caustic's, you know, voice lines. It was just amazing. Like, it was like, he was like, it, it, like I don't know how to explain. Like he's like an asshole, but he also, you know, you kind of can get behind him at the same time. And what's crazy, what's crazy is, is that, you know, like these guys, there's like no story really. It's just like a, you know, you're dumped in a battle arena. So like the the lore really comes from just from the voice actors, like the voice lines, and that's just to say how of an amazing job that you've done, you and the others to bring into life like this lore just from the the voice lines because there's really no story mode in in apex legends you know yeah, you kind of just have to go you, through the the voice lines and and uh, pick and see you know uh what they say and related to what others have said and and whatnot and stuff like that but my god like i remember when apex like hit Everyone was like, you got to get a, a Apex Legends voice actor to come and stuff. And, and uh, I was like, wow, like this is really big. Like I did not, you know, I was not, like, I was just like, wow, like, just, you know, just shocked. It, it came out of left field, just destroyed everything. Yeah, like I, I was like, okay, yeah, I like the game, but I didn't expect it to be like, you know, like, like this, you know? Yeah, well, it's exactly the same for us. We I have no idea what's, you have no idea what's going to take, you know, no idea. It, it really is a, a market driven business and some stuff will, will key in emotionally with people and some stuff just won't. Right, right. Uh, but particularly in Fortnite, yes, there was no, we weren't playing a storyline. Um, it was just, there was just, this is the character. And, you know, the great thing is about, uh, remember, as far as Caustic is concerned, the great thing about being an asshole is you get to emit a lot of gas. <laughs> See what I did there? Yes. Oh, yeah. The company's I, just free I flowing. Love... I don't even know how it comes. It just happens. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, I love, I love his gameplay because he's like a trapper kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, player, you gotta you, you gotta be very strategic on, on how to play him and stuff. I, I love I love having him on my team when I when I uh, play Apex. But um, speaking the of other, like the other, other way you can games, judge the success of a character, the other way you can judge the success. Sorry to interrupt. The other no, way you can no. judge the success success of a character is when you're doing a convention and four people turn up absolutely dressed exactly as Caustic, <laughs> with oh. they've made the costume completely perfectly, and you're like, okay. Okay, now people are really going to they're going to some lengths to their own yeah. bead caustic. Yeah. Then you know that you know something's going no, on. No, trust me, we, I, I've seen those people because you know we do cosplay contests also, and our cosplay. I was told like I didn't really know this at the time. Uh, I thought I was just doing something that's the the norm or whatever. Like that's how it's supposed to be done, but mm. apparently 
the cosplay contests that we do in Kuwait are like different than 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 any other country, uh, because he's wearing clothes. No, 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 no. no. Oh. It's 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 how it's how it's uh, shown. What I mean is. Uh, like in, in other conventions, usually it's just like kind of like a catwalk. They just, you know, just yeah, right. go on stage yeah. and show. To us, we do a whole skit. A performance. Like, a, oh, like an actual performance. Theater. Yeah, theater. <laughs> you know, with voice lines. Uh, uh. And, I mean, I mean uh, because um, I was, I was uh, doing the cosplay contest for, for a few years before we actually had um, – like a cosplayer come from outside uh, to like be a, a, a guest judge. And mm -hmm. they all told us like, listen, uh, what you need to know that you, what you guys are doing here is very unique when it comes to cosplay because other places, they just do a catwalk. They just, you know, come on stage like 30 seconds or whatever, like twirl around and then, you know, go back. You guys do like a five minute performance. <laughs> That is amazing. It's fantastic, and it's a brilliant idea. I think so, that's, you know. And I was I was surprised that like, well, not just me, but like just the the conventions that happen like in in our region. That's how they they do it. And like I'm surprised, like you know wh why like you know, like we're kind of relatively new to this uh, compared to like you know conventions in in the U.S. and Europe and Japan. I'm like, why they why don't they do that stuff over like in the U.S. and or like in Europe or whatever? And I I'm just kind of surprised that to this day we're still kind of unique in that aspect. So so I won't be surprised if our next cosplay contest happens uh, because you know now Apex has been out and everything. Uh, that our next skit will have some Apex Legends, you know, performance, and some guys probably gonna have your lines play or something, you know, uh, for the, the the and they go all out. Those guys are crazy, yo. Yeah. Th those guys are. But you know what? It, it it shows me that you 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 know, your your instincts are a strong, young Luke. <laughs> uh, yes. uh, it, sometimes a fresh perspective without any idea of how things should be done. Right. I mean. Uh, it's the same as true of being an actor. I don't want to play Bane the way everyone else has played Bane. I've got to try and block all of that out and find my Bane. What's my approach to, to Bane? What what connects me to that character? What can I bring to that character? Right. And it, and I, it, a completely fresh perspective, I think, is exactly what you need, and that's what you proved. I think that's great. I yeah, think it's fantastic. It was, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I remember it. we even asked uh, the, that uh, Final Fantasy director from Square Enix to be a, a guest judge. And he, he was like telling us like I've never seen something like this. Uh, I mean, forget about the the actual cosplay, like the costumes and stuff, just the performance, mm. like the commitment like, to people. Yeah. Yeah, he was just like he was just blown away, you know. But anyways, exactly. uh, <laughs> not talk about cosplay, but back to video games. Um, is there like not just in video games, but like in anime or 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 other voice work you've done? Is there like anything that you have like that's kind of like special for you, other than your first gig as you know uh, in Helsing? Is there like something that was like memorable memorable to you? It doesn't have to be like this one thing. It could be part of like you know a different thing. But like if there's just one thing you can mention that was like memorable or nice or funny. Oh, I mean, there's there, there's so many exactly, stupid yeah. stories, but so and so many things. I mean, the roles that I've really enjoyed and have meant something to me. I think Bane in Arkham Origins was a big deal for me. Um, I, I I really I really because it's again it's interesting. It's a it's a it's a character who's a big giant brute but highly educated, um, mm -hmm. and y you know finding that voice of dropping someone down here that is Latino but has this big booming voice but speaks at a pace that tells you that he has a very good education yeah, yeah. that is completely different i hadn't really heard that before and and so that meant a lot to me and the reaction was fantastic i got an amazing amazing response i did a series and it's sometimes the stuff that didn't go that is the is the stuff that's upsetting i did a, a, an animated series a new batman series called beware the batman in which i got to play arthur uh, arthur alfred <laughs> wow <laughs> 18,000 Batman fans just walked away. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, Arthur from Batman. Yeah, that's me. It's early in the morning, folks. I've only had one cup of coffee. Cut me some slack. Alfred in Beware the Batman. And, you know, Alfred, we got to play him like a bit more rough. Like he was, you know, he'd seen some times and he'd, he'd trained Batman. Um, and that he was a bit of a, a bit of a, a hard case, and and the relationship between him and Batman was was different. It was a, an amazing series. It got one season. Um, Cartoon Network was starting to do much younger 
Teen Titan Go's kind of stuff. Right. Uh, and and it, it got canned, much like Green Lantern, which was another great show. Um, so sometimes there are just market forces that take this stuff away from you. Just like, ah, I just, but I was just getting a grip on him. I was just, we were just right. starting to. Um, so it depends. You know, often it's just the people you work with. Um, I loved working on, on some of the Uncharted games. I got to work on two or three Uncharted games. Well, you know, working with Nolan North is 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 a, a, an exercise in massive comedy every day. He's one of the funniest people I've ever met. Um, and you get to spar all day with Nolan North. Well, that's just, I mean, what's better than that? <laughs> right. Um, you know, it's great. Um, Actually, I have a, I have a, a question um, um, because some of the credits that you have uh, under your name is like additional voices. Yeah. So those are usually just like, you know, background characters and stuff. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, when you go in for a session, um, you will may maybe you'll have a main character. Um and then you'll do some additional voices. You might do wallow, which is what we call the, the background street noises in an animation or something like that. Or a crowd suddenly goes, man, you have to go, oh, my God, look, it's a plane. Uh, and you have to come up with all these different voices. And the funny thing is that, you know, if you can do lots of voices, they'll get you to do the same bit several different ways. Oh, my God, it's a plane. Oh, my God, it's a plane. Look out, there's a plane. Hey, look there, it's a plane. What are you doing? There's a plane. You know, so you end up like... <laughs> Yeah, so you can be five different people in one little bit of waller. Um, so yes, it's not uncommon to do to do a couple of fill-ins. And if you look at like Ark, uh, Arkham Knight or Arkham Origins, I'm like third cop, second heavy, da -da 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 and you, you know. And then if you're doing animation, you know, I, I'm all. I mean, Elder Scrolls Online. I think I'm up to twenty-eight or thirty something characters in that one game. Wow. Uh, over the years. Oh. Uh, so it's, you know, uh, it changes, it, ch it changes everything because a, you have to keep track of whatever the hell you did before, which might be, you know, three years ago. Um, but, but I think a lot of times it's what makes this fun is the people you get to work with. And, uh, you know, there are certain companies I love working with and I love working for Blizzard, their commitment to quality, the detail they go into their respect for actors. I'll, I'll, you know. If Blizzard say jump, I say pretty much how high. Wow. Um, and and they're just, you know, it's just good people. I mean, I don't know, take a look out the window. Life can suck. Life can be hard. Yeah. This is a this is, we get to entertain people and and take them out of that tough existence just even for a few moments. That is an enormous privilege. That is an enormous privilege, and it's something I take very, very seriously. When you go and meet fans at a convention, it's extremely humbling because what we do, we do in a little black box, and we never really see the end results. Twitter will tell you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't really see the results. And so then, when you go and meet the fans, and you realise that there are, you know, millions of autistic kids in the in in the world who only get to communicate because they get to play games. Um, you meet soldiers. Uh, who who have been on the front line in in Afghanistan, and the way they wind down is by playing, ironically, Call of Duty. And you're like, what? And they're like, no, dude, you don't even understand. That helps me relax. You don't understand. That takes me away from it, and takes me into a fantasy land that I can bury myself in and and forget about what's going on outside the door of the hut that I'm in. That's amazing. That's amazing. When you see kids come up to you weeping, because you have had some sort of impact on their lives, nothing gives you more humility than that. It's it's extraordinary. And so you you when you're doing it, you don't really think about the power of what you're doing, but, but it's there. And uh, I, I I have huge respect for our fans and and for the people who work in this industry. It's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a really is a privilege. Well, anyways, we're kind of just you know getting to towards because I just I'm looking at the list of questions. We pretty much asked you everything that we we had uh, prepared. Uh, I don't know if Ali, there's like any additional question that you have. Uh, no, I'm, uh, you're good. good. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I'm, this guy, he's got nothing more to tell me. The guy never shuts up. <laughs> so uh, JB, I just want to, if there's like any, like, you know, last words you want to say uh, to the fans, uh, to the people uh, in Kuwait, whatever, uh, if you have any just la last words to end the episode on. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for, for being there for us. Thank you for your support. Thanks for tuning into this. Thanks for uh, 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 listening to these two very weird, slightly odd guys 
who I'm not quite sure about. I haven't seen any kind of criminal record history. There's been no background checks, so I don't know what they're going to do with this. Um, but but no, I'm 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 I, I've worked hard, but I'm but as I always say, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Uh, I've been very very lucky, and and uh, uh, it's an honor to come on shows like this and, and and be able to talk about it. And thank you for showing any interest. I I, I it always amazes me that people and, even and care. And I hope we can even uh, see you in person in the near future as well. So. Thank you. That, I'd love to come over yeah. and see you guys. That'd be. Cool. I mean, honestly, I'm just gonna say that we absolutely loved, you know, yeah. uh, this interview. We love people like you, specifically uh, people who are just, you know, joking around. I mean, half the half the episode were just, you know, laughing and joking around. And I mean, in the end, I mean, we work in a field that's about, you know, uh, having fun, right? So why why be so serious? Actors so, play parts. We do plays. We work on screen plays. If it's not playing, what the hell's the point? Exactly. So I, exactly. Even, even when I'm directing, I believe in us all working really hard. But if we're not having a good time, go do something else. Yeah. No, you I know? mean, I, I agree with you 100. You no, and, and, and you know, I, I just want to say, that, like, you know, like just how you are, you know, uh, thankful for, you know, the fans and what you do. I'm also thankful that somehow all the people that I've met that and that I've had you know connections with and I've been able to work with you know thank god they're all cool people so far cuz <laughs> I know there are some assholes you know I know there are some stuck up people and arrogant people but somehow you know I don't know how I <laughs> I did it but I so like I haven't had like any issues you know with like you know a uh, a guest or you know an interviewer or, or, or whatever and um, I, think, I, I think it's just because you're such a big asshole yourself that it's very difficult it's very for us to yeah it's very difficult to overtake the big yeah, asshole really, that, <laughs> <laughs> oh trust me I can be a huge here's, asshole here's the, here's the good news the assholes are a few and far between and when, when they happen everyone goes what? uh uh not here we protect this industry and I think you know, the camaraderie I experience in this industry is bigger than in any other aspect of the work and, I and do. And actually, can I, I, I want to give a, a kind of um, uh, unexpected shout out, actually. Uh, and it's, it's uh, to your agent. Oh, bless. Yes. Uh, incredible person. I am relatively new to the whole um, voice acting world. It's, 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 I would say I've only been in it for like two years or, or so. Um, not many connections. I'm, I'm more into the video game side of, you know, the, the developers and artists and that kind of stuff. Sure. And uh, the first couple of times I, I dipped my toes in, in this, uh, it was, I had a bad experience with the, with the agents that I was dealing with for like, you know, others. Oh, really? That's unheard of. I'm so I know, surprised. it's unheard of. Exactly. <laughs> And, you know, when, when I got in touch with, with your agent, Heather, oh, my God, it was, it was a breath of fresh air dealing with someone just as, as her. Yeah. You know? That's, like, she doesn't know how to do anything else, and that's why I love her. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, mean I, was, I was just blown away because, you know, I was comparing her to – to the to the others that I've I've spoken to at the time, and it was literally night. It was like it was like night and day difference, like left and right. You know, it was like up and down. It was like complete opposite. And I was like, wow, yeah, I I I have to find a way to stick with this lady and, and just keep working. You know, with her. You know, because because you know you want to work great. with people who are going to be you know fun and easy to work with. You know, you don't want to be stuck with people like you know doing stuff behind your back and stuff you know or like going back on their word or what have you listen what, what's another what's another name for an agent it's a representative right and that represents me she represents me to True. to the public so in choosing an agent yeah their reputation is huge uh the kind of clients they have whether they've got some nice big clients i mean she has Jim Cummings, the voice of Winnie the Pooh. She has Bob wow. Bergen, the voice of Porgy the Pig. You know, so she's got some good people on there. You're mixing in great, great company. Um, you're, you're mixing in, you're mixing in great company. But you know, she is my face to the outside world. It's yeah. really important to me that that's someone with integrity. It's someone that calls people back, no matter who they are, no matter what. 
a godforsaken electricity free piece of desert. They are calling. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I kid. No, you're not kidding. You're not kidding. <laughs> you have electricity, I can see there are lights reflecting in the shield behind you. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is uh, this is green screened. Even though we, we should not have green screen technology. We have. <laughs> What is this? Some kind of futuristic hell? What is what is going on there? Now you've blown my mind. You have green screen. Um, so so you know she's 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 my voice in the world. So it's really important to me that that. And I couldn't have. I mean, I struck gold with her. She's an amazing agent. Um, her reputation in town is amazing because she calls people back and she does what she did with you guys. And, yeah. And you know that's that's how I want to be represented. It's it's how I try and run my business, and that's a part of my business. So. Thank you for saying so. I will pass that on for sure. No, no, uh, I'm Should not. Be... I'm not even like you know trying to be nice or whatever because you know I'm an asshole, you know by nature. But <laughs> you've made this very clear, right? <laughs> so no, but this is I, I. I. I like to you know if someone really deserves a shout out, I. I like to give them a shout out and uh, and yeah, and stick she around, absolutely one hundred percent. Stick around, my friend, because you're a rare bird. <laughs> no, no like I like you know because because I I noticed that. Um, you know, when I told them, like, hey, you know, the, 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 the interview is open, like, you know, if he wants to do any kind of shout out, any kind of ad or whatever, just like feel free. And I think that's kind of unheard of, you know, because people like, you know, the, the whole contracts thing and, you know, you have to do this for me and I got to do that. And I'm like, OK, I understand that part. But, you know, it's also always nice because my personality is I like to be honest and open with people. So I don't want to have any kind of I mean, as as less barriers as as you know of as possible of course now there's, there's always tons of shit i can't talk about i'm right. under ndas for all kinds of stuff right, but right. I, i'm perfectly capable of governing what i let out and what i don't that's <laughs> that's you know just being mildly smart about things uh but 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 I, I i believe in the same i believe in being open and honest and the truth and, and you've you've done nothing but that and it's been nothing but a pleasure i, I really appreciate Thank it you. and the fact that you mentioned my agent, that really says something because not many people do. So I, I appreciate that, and I know she will. No, no, it's like I uh, – yeah, it was awesome. Anyways, uh, that's the end of the, the episode. JB, thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know, it's okay, it's okay. Thank you, guys. It's okay. amazing. <laughs> but, yeah, thank you so much, JB. We had a blast. This was fun. This was – we actually went on break for five weeks, so this is like our first episode since our break. So it's nice to start the the, 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 the new season, you know, with someone like you. It was, it was a great start, and I hope to look forward to, you know, working with you uh, in the near future, hopefully. And, yeah, thank you. And, if, JB, if you could just, uh, just stay with us uh, just like uh, 30 seconds. We're just going to close off the show and then just get back to you. If you just wait Absolutely. Like just, uh, just a quick shout out. Follow me at, uh, at the JB Blunk on Twitter. Uh, the JB and I Blunk, will, guys. Uh, if you send me, send me stuff, I will always try and respond if I can. So. All right. And we're going to post this uh, episode on, on YouTube anyway. So we're going to put all that information uh, on. Oh, screen. the world is going to be. Oh, dear. It's going to be sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I so... didn't do my hair. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, go get your wig. <laughs> Anyways, we'll be okay. right back with you, uh, JB. Just uh, hold on on the line just a second. Uh, Thanks very much. All right. So, Shalak Aliwi. صراحة أنا ما توقعت شيء لل والله العظيم للأمانة ما توقعت بهالطريقة الصراحة يعني ريال ونيس حد حد كول وبدينا يعني الحلقة الأولى ما الويانا يعني ضيف مثل هو هالطريقة الصح الصراحة وطبعا أنت تدري إن حنا بعد ضيوف عمالقة أول وراء أي إن شاء الله very very طبعا نحتابع على تويتر وكل شيء راح يعرفون فيعطيكم العافية جماعة وإن شاء الله نشوفكم أسبوع الجاي بحلقة جديدة.